Mr. Douglas. So good to see you. Indeed, Mrs. Stanton. It's so so nice to see you. And and looking at your home, and you was you always kept such an immaculate home. You look great. Well, thank you. You know, I couldn't have done it without my housekeeper. Uh, she she is responsible for much of the work. Well, uh, uh, you might say I had a housekeeper as well. <laughs> of course, uh, uh, my wife Anna Murray. Uh, she she held down the fort while I was. Uh, gallivanting all over the place, uh, even to Europe at times. So uh, I certainly could not have done the things that you were able to accomplish if I had to raise five children and, and clean house and those sorts of things. So how did she feel about your work? Well, she was wholly support, supportive of me. You know, she, uh, she was a freed woman. And she brought me out of bondage. Uh, you know, in my first autobiography, uh, I didn't name too many names at all. I was trying to protect the uh, those people who had who had uh, risked their reputations and their lives to get me out of bondage. And so I was criticized uh, for not mentioning her that much in uh, my first narrative and even my second. Uh, but Anna uh, was a wonderful housekeeper, a wonderful host. Uh, she even, as you know, uh, took part in a lot of the uh, background work uh, that it took to raise money for uh, the speeches and things like that uh, that we were trying to accomplish. Uh, the money was not flowing like a river on our side, you know. And, and so uh, she was part of the, uh, the uh, I think, the Quilting Society. Uh, I forgot the name of this organization up in Rochester, but it was a, a group of women uh, quilting, seamstress, making clothes and quilts uh, that they could sell in the marketplace and then raise money for, uh, for us to continue to speak and, and, and rent, rent venues and halls and such. Well, it is amazing, remarkable, how much work women did for the abolitionist cause. Uh, ordinary women spending their their time um, bent over the needle and thread, working and working uh, to sell things at fairs so that, so that the movement could continue. Uh, we likewise never had enough money in the suffragist movement. And I often thought that it was because it was so difficult to raise money from, well, certainly from the men who weren't very interested in supporting us, but also the women. And I often felt that uh, women would sew pin cushions for fairs for everybody but themselves. And so we, we never had anything um, until we, we did have some of the, the two major funds, uh, the Hobie Fund and the Jackson Fund. Um, but that money often was um, diverted to the abolitionist cause um, and the suffragist cause received but little. Um, Henry, um, Henry, people often ask me, if um, he was supportive. And um, I must say that he was by and large supportive. Uh, certainly as an abolitionist, he understood the concept of universal right. Um, but um, I think I can sympathize with Anna and all of the work that goes into maintaining a home and how that often keeps one from being involved in, in um, work of activism. The, the, the number of obstacles that women had was, was quite severe, quite severe. Uh, Anna had, of course, a, 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 an additional obstacle in that uh, uh, she, was, she was not that much of a reader. She actually, uh, as a matter of fact, uh, first Julie Griffiths taught my daughter, Rosetta, uh, how to read. And then Rosetta, in turn, uh, did her best attempt to help Anna how to read. And so she was not active in that regard as far as uh, uh, making speeches and, and writing letters and such. But uh, her manual labor cannot be, cannot be underestimated. Uh, and so uh, it was myself and looking at that and witnessing that, witnessing all the, the incredible talents that you all had. You were certainly a gifted writer and, a, and had a great legal mind uh, that seeing uh, all of these attributes that you all had that I had to stand, stand with women. Uh, and I went against my own, 
uh, I guess I went against my own uh, best thinking because I came out of uh, England and, and, and Ireland quite scarred because I, I got off track. I, I went there speaking about the abolition of slavery and promoting my first narrative. Uh, and then I got off track into the conversation about, you know, the Protestant and the Catholics. And, and, uh, and so I was, I was banned out of some, some churches over there. And I made up my mind I'm going to be a one, one cause man. But then, of course, I meet you in, in Massachusetts and we start talking and, and we are trying to get out from under the leadership of some great people. You, Mrs. Mott, and me, uh, William Lord Garrison, trying to find our own direction. Uh, and so we were able to do that. And so I think that it was a natural kinship that I was following the woman. I think we were always kindred spirits, very close in age, very close in our understanding of the efficacy of politics. Um, Henry certainly changed my mind about whether or not I should utilize politics to achieve my ends. Um, but I think Lucretia Mott was even a greater influence on me than Henry because Henry was a bit more, well, he was a bit more Machiavellian than Lucretia Mott was. And, and I think in many ways she, she acted as a kind of conscience for me. Um, she was very cautious when I said that I wanted the right to vote. She agreed that if the right existed, it should belong to all of us. But she was afraid that should we ask for it, should we demand it in public at a Garrisonian meeting um, in Seneca Falls? Most of the people who were in attendance, as you know, were, were Garrisonians, and many of them were Quakers, that we were yeah. opening ourselves to the criticism that, that we were being hypocrites, that we were being inconsistent. We had been saying, over and over that the, the vote and the entire political system, the constitution itself was a tool of evil. It was a slaveholder's constitution. Uh, were we to become an, a part of this corrupt system? And I do remember that conversation I had with me at Seneca Falls. I knew that I needed someone's voice um, and someone's voice who would be resounding and, and convincing, to uh, convince that group of Garrisonians and Quakers that the vote was not evil. Yes, I, I think that was our moment of reckoning that uh, after following the Garrisonians who really thought that moral suasion could win the day, uh, that uh, our realization that power concedes nothing without a demand. And so it was so bold that, that you women would would write that Declaration of Sentiments. Uh, my goodness, you were writing so fast. When I, by the time I got the letter <laughs> in Rochester, they said, uh, they said, we're gonna have a convention in two days. And so I couldn't even, I didn't even have time to put it in the paper. I just, I just packed up and, and came to Seneca Falls to support uh, the women. You all had sit there in the McClintock House and drafted that document. And, and I was one of the men who signed the Declaration of Sentiments. So um, it, it's, it's just uh, remarkable. Uh, all, all the women who were involved, uh, you know, so many women are left out, uh, including uh, Frances E.W. Harper and Ida B. Wells, all these women uh, in my lifetime uh, who were, uh, well, it was actually easier, I would say, uh, Elizabeth, for me to, uh, hold meetings and, and speak alongside the women like Ida B. Wells and, and uh, Frances E. W. Harper. And there was this issue uh, between us of race. And so uh, we were scoffed at many times when we walked down the street and when we tried to speak together. So we had that to deal with. I, I do recall that uh, in particular, how, how when, when you visited my cousin, um, Garrett Smith, uh, had to insist that you eat with um, the family uh, to his other guests who assumed that you could not take a meal with us. And those other guests, many of whom were um, ladies, 
Uh, and uh, Garrett Smith made it clear that if they didn't want to eat with you, then they could they could stay in their rooms and and eat like naughty children in their rooms. <laughs> and, uh, but I, I do remember that uh, there were many concerns and and between us, there were all of those coarse jokes, um, the minstrel shows that often refer to um, in one breath, the blacks and the bloomers, and uh, questioning the morality of women like me, um, not only in our, in our chosen garb, but in our company. And uh, yeah. it's no wonder that so few women of color um, join the ranks as leaders. I do recall, however, um, 1853, Susan toured with Sarah Parker Vermont, and um, Sarah went on to become a physician in Italy, um, but the entire nation lost that good woman's work for lack of concern for her. And Italy gained, um, gained a, a great worker for, for rights of, of human beings. That was something uh, that it really took some moral integrity uh, not to leave this country. As a matter of fact, many people might not know. Uh, not only did uh, Julie Griffiths and, and many others uh, in England raise the money for my freedom, uh, but they also raised enough to $2,500 for my, for my newspaper. And then they made an unusual proposition. They said, Mr. Douglas, why even go back to America? Why go back to a country uh, that has institutional slavery. Stay here with us. We'll send for your family. We'll send for Anna and your two children. And, and uh, you, you can just uh, live a life of comfort here. And so uh, slavery was, was this condition and, and, and the whole society and how they treated uh, particular people uh, that it was in many cases easier for them to leave the country and, and not come back. I know. And so... And so I was very fortunate that I made that decision. And, and right after coming back is when, when uh, I moved to Rochester and then uh, started intense work uh, alongside you. I, um, I was very tired at the end of my career. By the time my daughters were grown um, and Harriet, Hattie had moved to England and I visited her there and I spent years in England. And I decided that um, I, th I think I'd like to stay. I was rather tired of the work. Well, I, I think uh, the entire situation after, uh, after all the energy we put into uh, trying to get uh, universal suffrage and universal rights to vote, uh, that uh, that the woman had to stand aside after that. And then further, that we would win that right to men, black men would win that right to vote. Uh, and then the pushback uh, from reconstruction uh, really uh, just put a heavy, heavy burden on us. Uh, it was uh, that we had accomplished so much, but then we were pushed back. You know, the nation had grown extremely weary of trying to support reconstruction in the South uh, and basically was just giving it lip service. I mean, it takes, not only takes troops, but it takes dollars to enforce reconstruction in the South. Uh, and so because of that, uh, many of the gains that we had, even that right to vote for the black man uh, was, was taken back. And so this, you know, this creates a kind of internal sadness and, and, uh, and you wonder how you're going to keep going. And you're wondering if, thanks, thank God we had Susan B. Anthony who, who said failure is not an option. <laughs> she so, reminded us that failure was not an option. Yes, yeah. Susan, Susan B. Anthony and I um, realized that there was this golden moment at, at, after the Civil War. And um, that was the moment when we could have universal suffrage. It was, it was a very narrow window. 
and uh, we took it. We were lacking in funds, and so when, when George Francis Train offered us money after Wendell Phillips took the money away from us, um, there, was, uh, there was this idea that somehow we would be able to achieve universal suffrage. Um, but of course, um, that led to all manner of difficulty for all concerned. Well, in those, in those decades after, uh, uh, after the cracks in the foundation of our relationships were, were exposed and, and, and sometimes ugly things were said, I, I think uh, that was our that was our call to understand what what our relationship was really founded on from the first place. Uh, we all had uh, uh, the opportunity to uh, reflect uh, on what the things we were able to accomplish, uh, the relationships we had, and and how they were really meaningful, and how how we should you know just keep fighting. Uh, in spite of the fact that, you know, many people, I, I would say, I certainly was not, uh, I was not a fool in, in understanding that I was working alongside people who had more privilege than I. Race was certainly a factor. Um, wealth was certainly a factor. All of these things, you have to really um, make a concerted effort to say, these things are not more important than the overall objective that we're trying to reach. And so that's why, um, regardless of how they scoffed at us, I was proud to, to stand beside you and, and any, any woman who was standing up for their rights. I do remember that you were quite angry with Lucy Stone. Um, she had taken money to speak at a Philadelphia whites only hall and uh, she said that it was a misunderstanding that she hadn't understood that that would be the case. But uh, you were quite angry with her and I was always rather astonished that you were not more angry with me. Although certainly you let me know that the words I used were absolutely unacceptable to you and that our friendship did not excuse me. Um, but I remember being very, very worried actually I knew that as we were both on the lecture circuit and we were going to and fro on the railroads, that eventually I would run into you. And um, I, I did not relish the idea of meeting you face to face and seeing the disappointment in your eyes. Um, and inevitably we did meet. And I remember hanging back and Susan, forthright Susan, stuck out her hand and you took her hand and um, and I knew in that moment all was well. Um, remarkable that our friendship continued. Uh, but well, I, I think it did because uh, I was not just looking at uh, how people were treating you and the pain it caused for you, but I was looking at how people were treated me uh, and the pain, internal pain that I felt. Uh, and so we, we still had that in commonality. And, and of course, you, we can't. We keep coming back to this conversation about money and financing and such. Um, I, I wonder if the people of the modern era have such such problems with people uh, who who uh, divert funds for their own cause, who who try to steal uh, from worthy causes uh, to line their own pockets. I, I can remember uh, in, during Reconstruction uh, when I finally became the president of the Freedmen's Bank and Trust. Uh, that the coffers of that that bank had been pilfered, and it was almost uh, I mean I had to put about ten thousand dollars of my own money uh, just to keep the bank afloat, uh, but for a lost cause. I mean everybody had had their hands uh, in the bank uh, that was meant for uh, black men and women, people who wanted to have businesses to to buy homes to buy land. And so this is a serious issue, uh, uh, was a serious issue in our time, and I, and I hope that it's been uh, somewhat corrected in the modern era. I, I hope so. For us, the issue was often that married women 
despite law changes in New York State, in, in most places in the United States, it was very difficult for married women to have access to their own money. Um, I was very fortunate. I was the daughter of a lawyer. I was the wife and the mother of lawyers. And so I knew my way around um, the law and I was able to bring in my own income personally, but most women didn't have personal income to share with our movement. And we really depended on those funds that were, that were bequeathed to us. Um, when that money didn't come, we felt desperate. We felt desperate for money. Um, I don't know that anyone understands how much penny pinching there was. And Susan's role was so instrumental because as a single woman, she was able to hire halls and make arrangements. So many of us married women didn't have that luxury. And in, our, in travel, it was very difficult for us to travel without being escorted. Our reputations were always at stake. It occurs to me, actually, that both of us had a very similar problem, although we saw it from different angles. And the problem was the ascendancy of white malehood. That if one was not a white man, one was not a person, not a citizen. Yeah. And I could not be male. Yes, yes, yes. Well, uh, there were men in chapels, and then there were masterless men, masterless men and women. Uh, that's the way I described it, uh, masterless men and women. Uh, you didn't have a master figuratively, but your husbands, in, in so many words, were uh, your masters. And so uh, I, I saw the same thing uh, when I was in Fells Point, Baltimore, and I was uh, working for Mr. Hall, and he was hiring out my time. And at that time, the wage in the shipyard was around six to nine cents, and uh, six to nine dollars per week. And and he would have the audacity, after I worked an entire week and earned that six or nine dollars or whatever it was, to take my money as a robber, as a thief, and have me hand back me six, six cents as if he was doing me a favor. <laughs> and uh, and so these, these, are the, these are the situations we were facing uh, and able to, you know, to, it took money. It took money to catch a train. It took money to, to uh, bar, rent a horse or whatever we were doing uh, uh, to, to be able to accomplish all the things we were doing. So thank God for all those women who were, were sewing and making quilts and, um, you know, even as far back as Mrs. Mott, when she had the, uh, the gumption to say, we're not going to buy any more merchandise uh, made by slave labor. And so then they started themselves making all these products, uh, freed men and women making products. And so then that helped us contribute to, uh, to the cause of abolition, to the cause of, of women's suffrage. Uh, but if we had not had this ingenuity, uh, we would have uh, stalled, our, our efforts would have been stalled for lack of money. So we do keep coming back to that one issue of money. It is fascinating, but it's in that moment when one has worked, when one's labor and one's heart and tears have gone into something, and someone, because he is your master, your husband, your father, snatches all your work away from you snatches the credit away from you, snatches your ambition away from you, snatches your, self of, your sense of self away from you. And this, I think, was the fundamental foundation of my relationship with you, my dear friendship with you, is that you understood, unlike so many men I spoke to, including my husband, you understood the difference between a right and a privilege. And you understood yeah. that I ached because my privileges were gifts from my father and husband, but my rights, which come only from God, had been ignored in this nation. You understood that. Well, you taught me that. <laughs> so I'm so appreciative of the things that I have learned uh, uh, from the woman's movement, from woman's rights. And, uh, 
and uh, it, it rounded out my thinking um, because I saw many, uh, so many things. Uh, and and we, we would be remiss if we didn't also uh, mention uh, the Native American women, uh, especially in, in Rochester and in, in Canada, uh, those women who gave you all an example of uh, what a matriarchal-led society looked like. What, what woman privilege looks look like, uh, what woman's rights look like, not just privilege, but rights. Uh, they were able to uh, make decisions about, about their own communities. And so um, it, it's, uh, it's something that uh, a lot of times when we're talking about uh, this movement that we had, we, we, don't, we don't give credence to them, but we certainly or debt of gratitude uh, to, to the Native Americans. No, well, Lucretia Ma had come directly from Native American women, the Haudenosaunee women, and, and she had seen how they lived and how they possessed rights that we did not have, that we did not have protected. And um, later, of course, Matilda Jocelyn Gage wrote very movingly about the ideas of matriarchy and, um, and use the examples of the, the Native women in New York State um, to prove that white male supremacy is not natural, is not God-given. Um, you're right. They, uh, they do not receive the credit or the thanks that we all owe them. Well, I, I think uh, that uh, we were, uh, we, gave it, we gave everything that we, we could have given our time. Um, you more so than I. I mean, I, I, we, we in, we're ending where we began and talking about uh, the stark difference in the ability that I had to go out and speak and, and and leave my home, leave uh, Anna and my children there, uh, and not have a worry uh, that when I got back, things would be in shambles. Uh, and so I used that opportunity to, to go out to all over the country, to Ohio. I can remember attending anti-slavery conferences in, in Ohio and Michigan and uh, all across the country. And in every case, I, I tried to uh, speak for, I tried to include the woman's voice, uh, but of course it didn't matter whether I was at a, a white anti-slavery convention or, or a Negro anti-slavery convention, uh, the woman's voice was not respected and they would not allow women to speak. And especially uh, you were an absolute radical if you talked about a uh, woman voting. Uh, and so these were the things that, uh, that from my point of view, uh, that I faced, uh, that kept me uh, dedicated uh, to supporting uh, the woman rights. Well, I will tell you, Frederick, there were many men who disappointed me. My husband disappointed me. William Lloyd Garrison disappointed me. Wendell Phillips disappointed me. Horace Greeley, for certain. But my friendship with you was always strong because you understood because you were dear and understanding and patient, and because you were willing to stand with justice, even if it meant that you had to forgive your friends who failed to always stand with justice. Um, you came back to us, and I'm so thankful. And I do remember that last conversation we had Oh, yes. <laughs> well, uh, as a person gets older and you start realizing your mortality, uh, you start thinking about uh, uh, what would be your destiny? Is it going to be heaven or hell? <laughs> I, and, and I think we both uh, started realizing that uh, eventually one day we might have to meet St. Peter. <laughs> That's right. And you, you said that, um, that you believe that the angels would be on our side. And I said that I doubted it because it seemed to me that the forces on earth were aligned against us. 
I didn't have much faith that the forces of heaven would be in our favor either. <laughs> yes, and, and so uh, I think we were, I think you said, uh, well, I think St. Peter might say the gates of heaven are closed to us. And so we'll just have to join hands and, and march on into hell, hell together. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, yes. And that perhaps is the moral, is that if you're going to cause a revolution and great change, and you're going to be able to uh, look to a brighter future, you better choose allies who are willing to walk to hell with you. Absolutely, absolutely. Someone just given to my book, uh, my first narrative, Narrative of the Life of Frederick Douglass. Uh, but uh, the reason that I penned that last narrative, Life and Times, uh, was to give uh, some, to put in, in writing uh, some of the uh, gratitude that I felt for, for various people. And of course, when you start naming people, then you obviously leave out certain people that you should have uh, shown some appreciation to. Uh, but in that last narrative uh, that I wrote, uh, Life and Times of Frederick Douglass, uh, there is a chapter that I spend time uh, giving just due to all the things and the accomplishments that I had with you and Susan B. Anthony and, um, and uh, Mrs. Mott, uh, just a, a scores of women uh, who helped me understand uh, what universal suffrage is all about. Well, it is all of our work. Together, we cannot do it without each other. Amen. Amen. 